is Carrie Food Truth, and we are live here um, with Mr. Garrett Cavett. Uh, you go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Garrett Cavett, uh, Portland, Oregon, the veteran who was arrested uh, unjustly and illegally at the Bilderberg meet. Um, so just to start off with, um, why did you decide to go to Bilderberg in the first place? Uh, really, it was to find out for myself and to document for the people back here in Portland that were more or less naysayers of what was going on, just kind of doing what I could to educate the people around me and again to see for myself, even though I do believe, but I, I really was focused on, again, trying to find out for myself and just, what, just what was going on. And what was going on? The, a bunch of people that decide they want to get together, the oil oligarchs, the heads of state, the major business owners that make more money than, than they even need to exist, uh, meeting together illegally, you know, to actually see people just pull in one after the other and watch the, a hotel that claimed to be under renovations be guarded so, so heavily. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were arrested on Thursday. That was the first day of the conference. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yep, Thursday, I was there for a few hours, uh, began to see, kind of get a feel for the place. I, I walked around the perimeter as best I could to, to photograph what I could and find out, you know, where the line was, where, where you could and could not go. And really, in the beginning of the morning, the focus was really on that front gate as people were, were rolling in every 10 or 15 minutes. To, it was just like clockwork, all the vehicles that were coming in. Uh, I was going back and forth across the street as much as I could, trying to get as many photos uh, through the blacked out windows as I could, and realized that when you go from the front of the windshield, it doesn't matter how blacked out the windows are, you get a direct view of who's in the car. Um, so you crossed at the crosswalk? Yes, yeah, so I was going, basically, there. you can see plain as day because they had the street painted, uh, where the public road was, where private property was, and there was a good line where the, the painting marking, uh, paint markings for like the sewage underneath, whatever, but it was a good good indicator of where the property line was, and again, corner to corner, it's, it's, it's a crosswalk anywhere. It doesn't have to be marked or painted specifically for that reason. As long so as essentially you were crossing at the crosswalk, you were videotaping or taking photos and you were subsequently arrested? Yes. Um, after, you know, I don't, I can't recall the time of how long it was going on, but more and more people began to get in front and get these photos. Uh, people that had far better cameras than I did were getting excellent photos, and at one point I was just separated from the crowd, and they, mm -hmm. they, ma they moved right in on me. Okay, so, um, and if people want to find more about the either one of your arrests, they can they can go online and some of those videos are on YouTube. I understand. Yes, uh, both arrests and a, a few interviews are on YouTube, but the the two arrest videos are very easy to find at this point. Uh, a lot of people have been doing a lot of good things and continually, uh, once they're posted, people are reposting other people's postings and. Again, now it's it's not just a matter of finding it. You can you can easily access it to to see for yourself. How would people happened. search if they wanted to find those videos? Uh, keyword vet arrested Bilderberg and okay. that, or even my name. Uh, I've I I figured that if you type in my name at this point, it'll bring it up. But if you want to find the specific arrest video, the second one mm -hmm. is a little difficult. It's occupied Bilderberg arrest of two males. It's okay. It seems to be very hard to find the second video and not many people are aware of that second video even exists. Okay, so back to the first arrest, um, the one on Thursday. Um, while you were in custody, can you explain a little bit about what happened to you? Uh, yes. Um, I was taken in a uh, very hot day. Uh, we were left in the garage for about 10, 15, even 20 minutes just while the officer was on his phone for whatever reason. Um, that right there was kind of a, a red flag as to stepping inside. The when you say we, um, who was in the vehicle with you? Oh, Eric Clark uh, was also arrested with me. He was the gentleman that had the Ron Paul uh, written on t-shirt. Oh, so like a homemade Ron Paul shirt? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you were in the vehicle for some amount of time, and then what happened? Well, then he, he brings us out, and he trades us off, basically, uh, to 
to the uh, the staff that was there. He stayed around, of course, but he had some uh, paperwork and whatnot he was doing uh, while the the two officers basically gave us the the pat down, which was fine. They, you know, nothing happened then. It was only after we spoke with the magistrate and the officer lied about what was going on and why I was arrested and why Eric was arrested. It was only after that that the abuse, so to speak, happened. I mean, I don't, I won't call it, you know, like a, a rape, but it was definitely a molestation. You know, my. Okay. So what? What? What specifically happened? Uh, the officer took me over, you know, you take your shoes off, you, they, they start taking your property and they separate it for to be vacuum sealed. Um, at that point, I'm being uh, told to stand up, you know, you're going to go through yet another search. And at that time is when the officer came up behind me from underneath, you know, underneath and grabbed, I mean, he grabbed hard. and it. He grabbed onto your genitals? Yes. He grabbed my, I mean, I don't know how to put it other than he grabbed my balls and he squeezed and he squeezed hard and then he pulled down and right when he was pulling down is kind of when he gave me a, a jump back with the thumb and then right after that... Where did he press with his thumb? Just, he, it's not even a press, it was just a jolt. As he pulled down, he jolted back up with his thumb right in my ass, uh, my anus, so I thought... It, it was definitely a, a, a very uncomfortable and extremely awkward feeling, but that's not where, you know, and when I jumped it back like that, he got a hold of me again, and I have my hands, you know, just against this wall, you know, and then he goes right over the top, and, I mean, when he squeezes again this time, I almost come off my feet, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, then he walks away, and literally within 30 seconds, another officer comes over, and he, he says, oh, did that gentleman, you know, did the other officer pat you down? And I said, yes, he just did. Well, and then he says, I didn't see that, so we're going to do it again. And he stood me back up, and this time, you know, he goes again underneath, grabs, over the top, grabs. You know, again, it, it was a very uncomfortable and somewhat traumatic. I mean, like I said, it, I didn't I didn't just like cry about it or anything, but in my mind it, it, it worked with you know, this dehumanization, it, it worked pretty well because there's nothing I could do and I know they were trying to get a reaction out of me. All they were trying to do was get me to jerk one way or the other and then next thing you know I'm assaulting a police officer or something silly like that. Mm -hmm. And it, again I didn't give them the reaction that they wanted and um, I'm glad because I would have been, I would have been subject to even worse things being in that cell. So you said uh, you were you were patted down yet again. How many pat downs do you did you just have the two or how how many did you have there, total? There was think? five total. There was the original one when I was arrested. There was one when I got actually to the station and we just stepped in the door. Then there was two more after my my equipment had been taken off of me within 30, I mean, again, within a minute of each other, you know, one minute solid, I, I was touched, broke, and grabbed, I mean, they grabbed, they didn't, it's not like they felt me up, they grabbed to make a point, you know, mm -hmm. we can hurt you, and they did, you know, it was extremely painful, you know, uh, and then upon sealing my, my things, my personal effects, they leave my camcorder out, that's the one thing they didn't seal the first time, which made me very uncomfortable, but on the list of things that was going on, that was really not not what I was focusing on. So, um, when you were arrested, was your camp? Did you did you turn off your camcorder, or what what happened with that? My camcorder, they didn't even separate the battery from my camcorder, and then that's what I was explaining to people is when I got out of the jail cell, there was missing footage. There was things that had been removed, and then there were other things on my camera that. Uh, where it, it lets you know what was basically which folders were opened on because it's a internal hard drive on my camcorder and you could see that other things were accessed. Mm -hmm. So you had videos deleted off your camcorder? Just the last one from the arrest and then the first three or four, uh, again if you remember me showing you how it would just click off. Mm -hmm. I'd start, rec there was recorded videos I had that would start for three seconds then just stop and there was nothing after, and then we'd go on to the next video, a couple seconds, and Yeah, I did see that. And that's why I showed you, again, that first night when we got here, that my, my footage had been just cut through. Yeah. I mean, I really had nothing of any value other than myself being arrested, but they already knew that that video existed from other people. Okay, so, um, 
while you were in custody, um, did you get your normal phone call and all of that? No, after these pat-downs and my, my personal effects were sealed is when they had me step over and a nurse came in, not a doctor, a nurse, and she told me that I would be getting a shot. Uh, I had to go through all the three-page document of just, you know, what are you allergic to, all these things, you know, the, the cross and the T's and dot in the I's, part of the paperwork. And then I explained to her that I was not taking any kind of a shot, it was completely unnecessary, that I'm in perfect health and there would be absolutely no reason for me to need to be tested for TB. That's what she told you that, that it was? It was a tuberculosis test? Yeah, we're going to test you for TB. And I again told her, why if I'm leaving, why do I need a shot? Well, we can't, and she says, we're, we're not going to put you in the cell over there with everybody else, and she points right behind me, we're going to put you back there, which I didn't know what back there was, all I was told is it's going to be, you're going to be isolated by yourself, and that you're not going to be able to bond out because there are no phones back there. You're not going to get to use the phone, you're going to wait till tomorrow morning, you know, when the judge sees you, and at that arraignment, uh, we're going to bring you back, and if you still don't want to take the shot, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to sit in the cell until your court date by yourself. And I said, well, I'm going to need to talk to an attorney. It's like, no, you don't understand. You're not going to be allowed to use the phone. And so I, you were not going to be allowed to use the phone unless you took whatever injection yes. that they were going to give you? Yes. Uh, she made it adamant, again, like using the phone privilege against me. And then I'm like, if I can, why can't I use one of these phones in the middle? You know, I'm, I'm being completely supervised. You could, uh, you could be sick, and we need to keep you away from the general population if you are that and I, and I looked at her and I said do you know what's in that vial and she said yeah look it says right on the outside of it and I said no that's not good enough do you actually know what's in that are you a doctor she says no I'm a nurse I'm only here to administer the shot okay and, so, and uh, she, so what happened well at that point I looked over at the officer and I go officer I just want to speak to a lawyer I don't want to take a shot I'm not going to consent to this and he says you need to do what she tells you to that was his answer and I just put my and, and I put my arm out and I said I'm not consenting to this. I'm not going to do. I don't. I don't consent to this whatsoever. And as I'm talking to the officer, I get this little prick, and I was like, oh, and, and that was it. She did it basically as quick as she could. Um, after it was done, they, you know, they're smiling. Uh, it was. It so was what was the effect on you? You just got a pin prick, or what happened? You know, I again, I barely felt it. You know, but I knew right, and I looked at her when she did it. And I mean, it's 30 seconds. You know, I'm just kind of like, I'm still sitting there. I'm like, oh, what? You know, it's that taste, that metallic taste. And we again describing it as licking a nickel or a penny or whatever, putting your tongue to something, you know, of that of that nature. And it was really when I stood up that my head just started. I mean, it was instant, instant migraine. It was just pounding through my head, and then. Uh, walking over is like, you know, the movement was just alone. I don't have very much in my stomach at the time. It's like, uh, uh, but it wasn't like I was throwing up. I don't know how to explain it. I wasn't so like sick dry to my stomach. Yeah, but it was just kind of like, uh, like I was gagging. Like it, it wasn't like I was trying to throw up what was in my stomach, mm -hmm. but I was like, you know, it's just, it was so a felt really Ill. like cramping. It was real, real, like everything just went tensed up or whatnot. It was, it was not a comfortable feeling and again walking over to the cell uh, the the another officer that had not even not even got his you know not even been involved in this he decides to yeah we're gonna put him up against the glass where everybody that's in the cells can see they give me one more pat down this you know he doesn't grab onto me or anything but gives me a you know pat down and then they put me in there so do you believe that from your experience that that was a tuberculosis test? No, not at all. I've, I've had plenty of TB tests in the military. And it, no way whatsoever did I ever react that way. Mm -hmm. Plenty of shots in the military and never have I got that kind of a reaction. And the next day, what did your arm look like? Uh, it, it literally looked like I had a rash. It was, it, you could see the prick mark, but then around it, it was, it was red, and it was a considerable, you know, Probably area size, sized, about, you know, thumb size, it was a considerable yeah. area, no, no, no real other uh, visual other than just being bright red and seeing right where the pin prick was. Mm -hmm. Did you have any other, uh, were there any other symptoms 
um, other than the the rash and the, the pinprick? Did yeah. you have any symptoms that lasted? You said you had that initial migraine and the ill feeling. How long did that last? That until I until about three in the morning, four in the morning. Uh, when I got back to the hotel room, it was about two in the morning. I sat in the shower for about forty five minutes. I just I felt horrible. I, I drank about I think it was a full liter of water, uh, and then I started writing. I took a few. Uh, I had this. Uh, I had some Excedrin with me. I took a few of those, uh, just just to see, and I was able to at least focus enough to write. But then the next day, when I went out to or went down to the hotel to eat breakfast, I'm sitting there peppering my eggs, and I heavily pepper them. I can't even taste the pepper. It's a very awkward feeling to be sitting there trying to eat your breakfast, and it tastes like absolute. It's like it was eating cardboard. There's just no flavor, and that lasted up until a few days ago. I, I ate my first meal that I could taste, you know, three four days ago, and I'm like, what the hell is going on? So the the sort of lack of taste that yeah. lasted a few days. Oh yeah, it's okay. that that was prevalent that I couldn't taste anything. The 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 dry heaving and whatnot, you know, it it suffice and it stopped by the next day. But mm -hmm. yeah. okay, so um, you were released that night and you went back to to your you went back to the protest the next day. Um, Weren't you intimidated? I mean, were you afraid to go back to the protest? You know, as I'm leaving the, the police station, the one officer said, hey, you're not going back, right? You're done protesting, aren't you? You know, and that was, like, like everything they had done was to make sure that I learned my lesson and that I would be intimidated, but I'm sorry, that's just not the case. It made me angry, and not angry in a sense that I'm going to go back and I'm going to hurt anybody or do something stupid. Angry in here that that we've actually got to this point and it's not just in Fairfax County it's all over there's story upon story upon story of all these officers hurting people trying to intimidate and scare them and to just being being people that do what they're told to do mm -hmm. and not ask questions when the police work for the people and now it's it's opposite if you want to question an officer they're just gonna throw cuffs on you and arrest you and say something about you that's completely untrue. Mm -hmm. So the next day, I, I went and I went to the the Home Depot or the Lowe's that was there and bought them out of all their signs. And uh, the other gentleman came with me, had the bullhorn, and it was not it was an intimidation. It was you need to go back, and this is why now you're here. It wasn't to go attack the police. I spent the good first hour and a half you know, bullhorn in the police, not being rude, but, you know, getting on them a little bit. And that's what bothers me, is because it took away focus from me yelling at the real criminals behind the doors. So, intimidated, no. Uh, motivated and ready is what that made me. You know, it, it changed my outlook, like, well, if they can do this to me, and not like I'm anybody special, but I've never done anything wrong in my life, and I was treated like an absolute criminal by these people because I wanted to voice my opinion. I wanted to voice and voice everybody was there to voice their own you know, their own reasons, own it was like a family there. Mm -hmm. Honest to God, I've never met that many strangers in my life that were that close to family instantly. Same like minded individuals pushing for the same the same goal. You know, it's it's really motivational and inspirational and within being there an hour the next morning that's how I felt. I was embraced for, hey, we saw what happened, man. Don't let them. We're all one family here. You know, and all these people that tried to support me, I, I realized that you're doing right. You must be doing something right. Mm -hmm. You know, you're obviously not doing something wrong if this many people that you don't even know are this supportive. And for that, I, it gave me the strength to go right back and support everybody that was there. It makes you stronger to be a team. When you unite like that, there's nothing they can do. Mm -hmm. and so you were arrested again uh, early Saturday afternoon. Can you just explain briefly what happened there? Yeah, I uh, I saw the crowd and the and the police. Uh, I thought they were doing what they did the other day. Uh, the d day prior, they had lined up the road and they had snatched that one guy that had just walked up out of nowhere. Yeah, there was a gentleman that just barely stepped off the sidewalk from what I can tell and he yeah. was arrested immediately. Yeah, when you see it from the, the angle going upward, you, you just see him. I mean, they snatch him. They, he does absolutely. He's got his back turned. He doesn't even know what's going on. Next thing you know, he's being dragged and, and I mean, he's being manhandled and mobbed him. Mm -hmm. 
They, they, they didn't just arrest him. They tried to make a point. Like, yeah, if anybody else gets out, this is what's going to happen to you. And that's... It's just wrong. I mean, <laughs> that's completely legal, and they all of them should be put on administrative leave. Uh, I mean, just for that single arrest. So what happened to you on Saturday? I'm sorry. Uh, either way, I saw that same thing happening. So I went down, and I got right in front of the vehicle, and I, and, hey, you know, I'm just, hi, how are you? You know, you're not, you're not going to scare people. I know these people might not, you know, because on Saturday... There was there was a lot more people that had not been there, so maybe again the police wanted to do that show of force thing or whatnot. And for people that had already been there, it gives people a little bit of a, a cushion. They feel a little bit safer that no, these police aren't going to do anything. And that's I went down to the base of the truck. Uh, they took off again, realizing how outnumbered they were. Uh, Are you talking about a police vehicle? Yes, the truck oh. that they came down six deep in, mm -hmm. and then they just left and. That that point is when I stepped out about three or four feet into the street. Um, clearly, a few feet in the road. Uh, there's and no. And you're one. addressing the crowd at that point. Yes, I'm. There's no cars coming down the road. I'm just. I wanted to get out, and exp you know, and, and that's what I did. When we stand together, you know, positive messages. When we stand together, that's fine. When they come down here to show a force, don't do anything. Don't don't do anything that's going to prompt them. But you know what? Stand strong. Keep your chin up. Don't don't let these officers intimidate you. When we stand together, you lock arms, you, you solidify yourself as one unit, and they'll back off. And that's what they had done up until that point. So when you, um, so you're in the road for some period of time, and then you, you go back onto the sidewalk, yeah. is I, that right? I, I go back into the crowd, uh, and I start talking to people, and then, you know, they flip around, and here they come back down. They started coming back down maybe five minutes later. They sat at the top of the road for a good five minutes, easy. And then as they come back down, it's like, all right, you know, I start hollering at people, all right, here they come again, line up, you know, stand, don't do anything violent, but stand up for yourselves. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of these police officers. They're the ones trying to intimidate. They're the ones trying to harass. They're the ones trying to cr create violence. And it's, it's just too easy to stand there and look them right in the face and, and say what you want to them, but, you know, don't, don't. Don't be violent. That's the easiest part of, of the whole process, but don't be so, scared either. So after the... So at what point were you actually arrested then? Um, they, they started coming like they were looking for someone through the crowd. Uh, at one point I look over and I hear, grab him, or something like that, and I'm like... And I kind of zipped away. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I was a bit intimidated. I'm mm -hmm. sitting in the crowd and all of a sudden, here they come. I mean, they're five feet away from me and all of a sudden they make a mad dash. So, with what happened to me a couple of days prior, I was like, whoa, 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 hold on. I don't, I want to make sure I'm in a clear area, mm -hmm. not in a crowd where something can happen and nobody's going to see what happened. And I got away and then I, I just put, you know, I got 10 feet away to an open area and I pulled my arms up. I'm like, whoa, what's going on? What's going on? And then the officer right behind me, he, you know, he, he's got his hand on his gun and I'm, again, I just like, hey, 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 whoa, are you after me? And I ran a little more and then another one, you know, they just crunched me in and, and took me away. Okay, um, so you were just sort of tackled and arrested again? Yeah, just against the fence. Again, I, two of them came together, pushed me against the fence, and grabbed me. Okay. Stole stole my contact information again. Um, you know, and that's that's what's really sad, is that once I was in the back looking, uh, looking through their police van, because they put me right behind it so I could see that not only were they not just filming people, that was a live feed to a, to a command center. So every time the police officers had a camera, that was a live feed to their center and they're getting directions, you know, from the tower. And so you saw this, you saw that they had they had the ability and they were filming people live. Yep. They the were time. they were they actually had a whole little command truck, but then they were taking orders from the suits. You know, there were suits that came down, uh, two different suits that was come and you know, the trucks wide open, they got like six monitors in there and they're continually uh, rotating through and I can see everybody but I also saw camera angles that I couldn't explain. I saw camera angles above people looking down from 20 feet up in the air but there's I never saw any cameras in the trees or anything like that but there were there were some interesting angles that I, I couldn't explain. And hmm. Okay so um, what are the charges that you're facing from these two arrests? What, what, what have you been charged with? So the first three charges are going to be uh, impediment of a vehicle, obstructing a vehicle, uh, disorderly conduct, and drunk in public. 
all three of those charges are illegitimate and trumped up. They're, they were just to get me off the scene. I know that now. So drunk in public, um, were you administered any kind of breathalyzer or a, a test or anything of that sort to determine if you were in fact to intoxicated? No. When, when we sat down, uh, the officer was making his case to the magistrate behind the window and he said that I was highly intoxicated. I interrupted the officer right then and right there and said, because literally the office where we sat with the magistrate, well, I cite the sign, you know, for when they bring in somebody for a DUI breathalyzer machine. I'm like, we can solve this right now. It's, this is too easy. It takes 30 seconds to administer a breathalyzer. So you asked for a breathalyzer. I asked at first, you know, and then the magistrate wanted the officer to continue what he said was saying, and I got a little bit upset at that point. I said, and I interrupted again. I said, no, sir, you're going to give me a breathalyzer. You're not going to lie. You know, I demanded it, and that, you know, I know that wasn't the right way to do it, but I, I'm, I'm sorry. What are you supposed to do at that point when you're being lied on by an officer who's supposed to uphold the law, and he's lying point blank through his teeth? and you can prove it. So were you ever administered any kind of test or any, any kind of breathalyzer or anything to that effect to, to maybe prove that you were drunk or something like no, that? No, as I got a little bit angrier about, about the officer lying on me, the magistrate says that you're clearly upset and I believe that you're intoxicated. And I was, I, I, I did everything I could to hold my tongue right there and I looked over at the other gentleman that was arrested with me, Eric, and he's just shaking his head, and he's you know he's just like calm down. You know, if you get angry, you give them you give them the power when you get angry. And I, I, I was I was just shocked more than anything that wait a minute you're the, he explained the magistrate explained to us he was there for checks and balances to make sure people are not arrested for no reason to to give people the benefit of the doubt, not the officer. The, the officer right then at that window has to prove himself. And not that I don't have to really prove anything. It's on the officer to prove, and that because I was angry, he was willing to agree that I was intoxicated. And uh, as uh, even though again, you were angry about not being administered, that's correct. Officer. And you know, it it's again, it's very upsetting to see that that's the kind of system that's in place. That you know they were protecting each other. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh. So, this. This story sort of reminded me of something that you t uh, told me earlier in another interview. Um, is it true that you were not read your rights, that you didn't get your Miranda rights? No, and not one time in this entire process, not the first arrest, not when we're at the police station, not when the magistrate types out your actual arrest, are you read your rights for anything. And did they give you any justification for that, or did you, did you talk to them about that? Well, they gave me the justification. They don't have to in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That is, ex I mean, verbatim, we're in the Commonwealth. You don't, we don't have to read you your rights. You know, both the cop and the magistrate said that to me. You know, and the, again, smiles on their face, that first arrest. They, it was like, again, I felt like I was being goaded the entire time that I'm there. Mm -hmm. And again, did I know the law for Fairfax County or the Commonwealth of Virginia at the time? No. So, bite your tongue. I know constitutionally I'm supposed to be read my rights any darn where that I'm anywhere. That's what I do know. So I just left it at that. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get anywhere arguing at this point. Obviously you're being arrested. And again I was told I was detained then arrested once the charges were typed out and they slide them under the window. But and you were cuffed, you in the back of the car, cuffed, you're in at the station, that whole time they told you you were being detained, not yeah, arrested? That you're detained right now. I, I did, wasn't told I was under arrest. That's hmm. the weird part. The, the second time I was told I was under arrest, instantly. First time, I'm not even told I'm under arrest. They just grab me and they, they take me to the station. That's what the magistrate You're being detained right now because I have to decide if what the officer said is saying is true in order to type out your arrest warrants. Yeah. And again all three arrest warrants were issued so for the second arrest or detainment um what are the f the charges you're facing for that the charges again on the second arrest will be uh once again impediment of a vehicle obstructing a vehicle which yes i stepped out on the road and it's a couple feet i mean there was, was, was there any car no cutting? vehicle there's mm -hmm. not i mean there's p people again when you see the video of the sideways angle you, you see there's not a car for it there's not a car anywhere 
Not even up the road. You you got you got two hundred yards. Mm -hmm. I'm two hundred yards. I can see up the road. And what are the other charges? Uh, disorderly conduct and then resisting arrest. They're gonna give me uh, and I looked up the resisting arrest because I know I stepped away uh, from the officers when they ran at me, but I had good right to. I had no. <laughs> you have no reason to be chasing me through out of nowhere. Like again, when I saw his five feet and I hear get him. I don't even know who they're talking about at that point, but I just zip across the way, and when I see they're behind me, I'm like, whoa, 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 guys, what is going on? Uh, Back to that attorney, though. Do I do I want to use him? No. Did he give me something that was reasonable to, to pay him? Right. He basically charged me $750 so I could get out of the state. You know, I could have filed the motion myself, uh, which, once again, I did not trust doing. If I go in and speak to a judge, which it was clearly the case of I'm definitely coming back for this I have no reason not to you know go back through my you can go through that my, my history there's no there's no reason to say that I would not want to deal with this and but again it, it seemed like the bondsman the lawyer the judge the magistrate and the police when everybody's in on it do I want to file that motion myself no did I talk to somebody back here uh, the, the night prior about the motion, uh, another attorney that's back here, and he said there is absolutely no reason that won't go through, but if you file it yourself, they can, y you can be treated different. First is a lawyer that will say, this is, this, I know this statute, I know this statute, no, or, you know, I know this rule, that's not going to happen. They know that as much as I, I can read about it, I don't know these these loopholes or whatnot that I would need to say if my rights were being violated by the judge. Mm -hmm. So, once again, I had to use that lawyer. Now, do I want to use him? No, I, I don't. I think it's very suspect how everything happened. He was brought in immediately after I was told that I could bond out. They, I told, you know, I don't have the money to bond out. Somebody back here was right on it, bonded me out immediately, and I don't think they knew what hit him because, like I said, they sent that lawyer in ten minutes later and then as I'm going to leave, the magistrate slides under the piece of paper and he's like, look at the conditions of your release before you sign that. And he has this really evil look on his face. And I look and it says, confined to the state of Virginia. And I said, can I speak with the lawyer about this? Because I just spoke with one. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. And he, and he has a seat that they tell me that they're going to, once again, put me back in, like, I have to go process again. I have to... <laughs> Go get a jumpsuit and be taken back if I want to talk. You can see your lawyer tomorrow. They, they leave that out. I, I simply ask the magistrate, may I speak to an attorney about this before I sign it? Sure can. And I'm like, oh, I should have known that it was going to be what it was. And that's as soon as he gets that piece of paper back, they're trying to take me back and say that I, deny, that I didn't want to get out. And it's a lie. It's clearly a lie. And, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you just told me I could. And he's like, well, you can, but you're going back into that cell. I'm like, and I signed, I'm like, to get out of the doors, I just signed it. And then I took the next step after that, and, and that was talking to that lawyer, finding out why he didn't care that the magistrate pu tried to pull that trickery on me. He didn't care at all. He's like, are you going to hire me or not? Because I can file the motion tomorrow. Are you going to hire me or not? It was very pressurized. To, he, to, get, to get this low rate fee he was telling me because he believed in my cause and he was a Ron Paul supporter himself. So um, so they ended up filing a motion so you could leave the state then? Yes, and another thing happened the next morning. We were into the, the courtroom. The, the very second case, on the second case that gets called, my lawyer is just stepping in the door right when they call me. And, I, and again, so I... essentially late. I have never met a lawyer in my life that wasn't there five minutes early or something to talk with their client, not just coming in the door as my name's called once, and then he's right there. I hand him, and then he goes up. He spends five minutes, if that, speaking to the judge, saying uh, that I can go and that the bondsman, who also knew, the bondsman knew he had to write a letter. He knew he had to, and he just conveniently left that part out. I had to go, I asked him to bring me the letter, he had something come up that night. I had to go to his house to get the letter. I had to drive to where he lived to get the letter. Again, very coincidental how everything was trying, I've never seen so many things against you to get 
again, to, to have you believe that people were working together there. It's all about the money for them, and like I said, they, they tapped me clean of everything I did have there, uh, and then that I did have back home that, you know, again, thanks for the people back here that were right on it, because if, if someone hadn't been on it right after that arraignment, I can only imagine where I'd be or what would be happening to my, me right now. So since you've been home, um, have you contacted, um, you know, any news agencies or even in Virginia? Did you try to get a hold of anyone to try to tell your story? I, after I called uh, Friday morning and Saturday morning to five of the, uh, the Washington Times, Washington Post, uh, the MSNBC, Fox News, and uh, CNBC, all of them said that they're within a local area of there. Uh, they have, again, there's new team, news teams everywhere, and all of them had that same response of, oh, hey, thanks for the tip, we'll, we'll get on that, you know, both days. All the, it's like everyone had the same scripted answer. Uh, and there and was no follow-up for anyone? None. I mean, you, you saw there was absolutely nobody uh, from mainstream media covering this. And at that point, who am I going to tell my story to? If they won't even come because a, of a protest going on, I left out Bilderberg, but everybody in that county knows. Everybody in Fairfax County knows. They just pretend they don't. It's a very, very rich county. People want to keep it that way. They don't want any waves. They just they go with the flow there. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of money in that in that county. When you were in custody, um, did anyone try to check up on you or say, like, call the station, anything like that? Yes. Uh, there were several people that called the police station. Uh, several people were lied to. They were told that I was not in custody there, um, which made people back here at home very, very angry to the point where, you know, they, they, they were yelling at the police, like, don't, don't lie to us. We know he's there. You know, tell us tell us the truth and according I may be wrong about this but as far as I know by law if somebody calls to find out somebody's in jail they have to it's a matter of public record but I don't know that so I'm you know don't quote me on it and, and it's gonna be having something I have to really look up but enough people called from back here hopefully to to, to really to really anger them because they started watching like, the videos while I was in there it got it got to the point where I you know it's not that I was scared again it's just I was ready I was ready for whatever they were gonna do but I know I didn't want to end my life in Virginia I didn't want to end my life in Fairfax County be locked up throw away the key and no one ever see me again because that's that's how serious it really was mm -hmm. I was one step away from somehow being charged with something else and then there you go I'm stuck until jail you know until the judge and then the judge sees this three-day pattern of, you know, crap that's not even true, and I, 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 ha I feel whole 100% that that judge would have ruled against me and kept me in that jail system. So I understand you made a, a written record of what happened to you at least that first day um, when you were back at your hotel. What happened to that, that record? I spent from about 2, 1.32 in the morning to about 5.30 in the morning writing. And I mean, I, I put together almost, it was 10 to 15. And I mean, I, I, I want to say the exact number was 16 because I was, I was numbering pages. But I had an account of everything from the time I got there to include when I left here, the interesting ordeal with my rental car not being uh, given to me, the the uh, the flight change or the gate change when I got to Boston. I had everything documented to the T, but I was not able to pack up my own hotel room. While I was in jail, uh, my hotel room was set to expire along with my plane ticket. And when I got through all of my stuff and started going through, I realized that my legal pad that was in my uh, my planner folder was gone. Everything that I had written was gone. So your planner folder was there and the legal pad was missing? planner folder was there and there was nothing inside of it. Do you, you know, know who packed up your things? Uh, the hotel staff. And it's interesting because when I went to pick my bags up, the hotel staff knew exactly what had been going on. The, the guy, there was a, I assume he was the head of security or whatnot, came up, shook my hand, started talking to me. The bartender behind the bar poured me, you know, I asked him for a drink. He pours me, you know, this heavy drink and they're all smiling. He, you know, it, it was very awkward for them to not even acknowledge me really when I was there the last two days, but then when I'm there picking my stuff up, it, it's... So they all seemed to know who you were and what the situation. And they were, and they were trying to, you know, keep me positive. There were all these positive messages, and I, I know why. You know, hey, don't look in your stuff. You know, don't, again, 
Maybe if you trust the if you ho if you trust the hotel people, you're not going to think it was them. When, when it was obvious, I mean, they packed my stuff up. Nothing else is missing. Nothing else is tampered with. But there's a yellow one of the yellow legal pads, chalked with information, completely gone. The whole thing, not just the pages, the whole thing. Okay. Um, do you know if any of the other arrestees were subject to uh, the same type of treatment, either the sexual assault or, or um, injection, anything like that? No. And now, Eric Clark was with me that first day. Uh, he consented to the TB test just fine, and no, he had absolutely no reaction to it. He also witnessed the police do what they did to me, and then they didn't do anything like that, too. They went, you know, back to the it's just fine with him. They didn't okay, him so, um, but did you see him get the um, TB test, or no. he just told you that? He just told me point? he had it, and uh, I never saw his arm after that. The entire time I never saw it, and I'm not sure about the young kid that was pulled, that was uh, mobbed by the police, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, other reporter, the small female that was uh, also mobbed, uh, I'm not sure what happened with her as well. I just haven't been able to get in contact with either two. Okay. Um, what is the best thing that people can do at this point to, to help your situation if they wanted to do that? You know, it, it's not about donating money. It's not. A, I mean, yes, donating some money would help. There's no doubt about that. Especially at this point, even a buck. You know, anything helps at this point. But a phone call. You know, a lot of people back here have asked me, well, what can I do to help? And that's my answer. You could call the governor of Virginia. You could call the governor of Oregon. You can call your local delegate. You can call your local city council. You can call the uh, again, news stations. The, in the I was going to say the local news stations are my next to see if they're even going to pick this up, and when, if and when they do, or if and when they do not pick this up, will be a very you know it's going to draw yet another line in the sand as to how far this is really going to go. If my local news won't even protect me as a citizen of the state, uh, it's going to be it's not going to be something that's pretty for me, you know. And again, anybody, your resources, your time. If I cannot get the charges dropped before I go back to VA, I'm not going back to Virginia alone. I'm not scared. I'm ready. But I'm also not going to allow myself to be grabbed, arrested, and charged with something now that the protest is gone. And now that there's going to be nobody around, it'll be a little bit different this time. And do I see them making something up and taking me in? Yes, I do. There's no doubt in my mind. I was pre-warned while I was in jail that, you know, hey, things, you don't want to shut your mouth. This, this is what's going to happen. You know, we're subtle hints that things are going to happen. You know, we can just grab you. Why do you not understand that yet? That we don't need, we don't have to read you your rights here. We don't have to, act, you don't actually have to commit a crime. We just say you do, and it happens, because this is fair. You know, Fairfax County, they're proud of their county. They're proud of who they are and, and being able to just, hey, we run this place. Nobody, nobody, nobody's going to be able to stop that. Or, and it's not, I just want them to go about their, whatever they want to do, you know, but what people can do that live outside of, uh, of Portland here, you know, I don't expect everybody in Portland to come with me to Virginia, but if you live next to Virginia and you have some time, you know, a few hours, and I know it's, you know, it's asking a lot, but not really, you know. Come and make sure that when I'm there, I'm not protected, but we stand together. We stand united. It's, it's not just me. I'm not fighting this. It's our fight. It's our fight against them. And yes, I know it's all, you know, attributed right now or attached to me, but if someone wants to stand there with their camera as a witness to even say, hey, you're not going to grab this guy. That means the world to me, you know? That means that I don't have to worry. And as long as I have, what, ten people with me, all with cameras, maybe one doing what you do with the live stream, there's nothing that can happen to me. They'd have to do it to everybody. And do I ask people to take on that risk? No, you don't have to, you know? But if it was you, would I come to your aid if I was, if something happened here in Portland and I didn't know you and you said, hey, if there's anybody local, will you come down? I'm your guy. You know, I'm right there on the front line saying, you're not going to harass or take this, per you know, you're not going to do this. It stops here. I, I would protect anybody that, again, I, I felt like I walked into a whole brand new family that I had never known. 
closer to my fam closer like family to me than my family's ever been. It's just it felt to have that many people with the passion and the drive and the ideas, you know, everybody had their reasons for being there. For their own personal family, for loved ones they may have lost, and I said for me, for, for the soldiers that I've lost, and for the soldiers that aren't allowed to fight right now, because uh, I'm telling you, a good portion of the military has woken up, and they're fed, they're, they're upset. You know, they're, they know that they've been going in and hurting people innocently, destroying families all over money and oil and, and all sorts of things. And then when they think back, wow, what if that was my family? We're, we're soldiers. We sign up to fight for the right reasons, not the wrong. Once a soldier finds out they've been fighting for the wrong reasons, it's it's not something that's, a, you know, there's a reason the suicide rate is what it is right now with soldiers. You you feel duped and trapped because you signed a contract giving up, you know, you, you wanted to protect something, and now you're being used by NATO, the United Nations, as a pawn. It's not even our government using us. It's the United Nations. And we're not subject to listen to them. Obama has no business even heading that. We have no business listening. Those are illegal orders. And the, the, the generals and the, the, the high-ranking government military officials are supposed to be stopping this. It's their job to, to protect and use our, the soldiers properly. Okay, so um, is there anything else that you want to you wanna tell people just about this experience, about anything? Uh, it's, it's definitely eye-opening. Uh, you know, I knew, I, I like to say I knew what I was getting myself into uh, by going to Virginia, but I, I had no idea that I could be compromised in such a way that no matter how honest, no matter how caring of a person you are, their law reigns supreme. They're going to do what they want to do, and if it's not you that they didn't come, you know, it's, if they don't come for you now, they're going to come for you later. Uh, that's just what it is. They'll take out one group, the next group, the next group, and, you know, it's that, like that quote I was trying to, to uh, re-administer, that one day you're going to be standing there, and because they didn't come for you all those other times, when they do come for you, you're going to have nobody to stand next to you. All right, so um, this is uh, Carrie Medina um, signing off here with uh, Garrett Cavett. Uh, you can uh, follow updates if you'd like um, on my uh, Twitter handle. It's at Carrie Faux Truth. That's at C A R R I E F O T R U T H. Um, you can also follow um, and get this interview in, in full on my YouTube channel. That's P S U Carrie Ray. P S U C A R R I E R A E. And um, I want to um, definitely recommend um, if you have some time go ahead and start making some phone calls. Um, call local news channels and ask them to pick up this story about Garrett Cavett. And um, call your local, uh, you know, governor. You actually call the governor of what, Oregon and yeah. Virginia? Call them both. Or the DA. You know, that I left out. That's a crucial per Call the DA of Portland. He, he'd love, I'm sure he'd love to hear about it from once about a hundred people get on him about it probably something he's going to look into and again it's he can just make a phone call to another person and maybe it just all goes away you know mm -hmm. and that's probably the simplest answer it's we know that the big problem's not going to go away but it it gets us back on a level playing surface where I'm not again fighting uphill like they told me I would be fighting mm -hmm. and I also want to uh, tell you guys you can donate to uh, the legal expense fund for Garrett at www.wepay.com slash donations slash 157736. That's wepay.com slash donations slash 157736. Um, well, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate everything you're doing. I yeah. really do. It yeah. means a lot to me. Absolutely. And everybody. Everybody. What everyone has done, again, the, the support across the United States and Europe right now is... I, I cannot, I, again, to know that these people still exist and that we're all in this together, you know, mm -hmm. that's, again, that right there, see, that's that feeling in the heart. Ah, that, that does great. remind me, I'm supposed to give you regards from uh, South Carolina, Australia, the London, UK, Serbia, and Washington, D.C. Those are all people that have contacted me and, and told me to uh, send their regards from their state or country. And, so. and thank every one of you that, that have sent me your love and your best wishes, and again, we can do this. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Garrett. Thank you.